The American Scholar by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Mr. President and gentlemen, I greet you on the recommencement of our literary year. Our anniversary is one of hope, and, perhaps, not enough of labor. We not meet for games of strength or skill, for the recitation of histories, tragedies, and odes like the ancient Greeks, for parliaments of love and poesy like the troubadours, nor for the advancement of science like our contemporaries in the British and European capitals. Thus far, our holiday has been simply a friendly sign of the survival of the love of letters and want people too busy to give to letters any more. As such, it is precious as a sign of an indestructible instinct. Perhaps the time has already come when it ought to be, and will be, something else, when the sluggard intellect of this continent will look from under its iron lids and fill the postponed expectation of the world with something better than the exertions of mechanical skill. Our day of dependence, our long apprenticeship to the learning of other lands, draws to a close. The millions that around us are rushing into life cannot always be fed on the sere remains of foreign harvests. Events, actions arise, that must be sung, that will sing themselves. Who can doubt that poetry will revive and lead in a new age, as the star in the constellation harp, which now flames in our zenith, astronomers announce, shall one day be the pole star for a thousand years? In this hope, I accept the topic which not only usage, but the nature of our association seems to prescribe to this day, the American scholar. Year by year we come up hither to read one more chapter of his biography. Let us inquire what light new days and events have thrown on this character and his hopes. It is one of those fables which, out of an unknown antiquity, convey an unlooked-for wisdom that the gods in the beginning divided man into men, that he might be more helpful to himself, just as the hand was divided into fingers, the better to answer its end. The old fable covers a doctrine, ever new and sublime, that there is one man, present to all particular men only partially, or through one faculty, and that you must take the whole society to find the whole man. Man is not a farmer, or a professor, or an engineer, but he is all. Man is priest, and scholar, and statesman, and producer, and soldier. In the divided or social state, these functions are parceled out to individuals, each of whom aims to do his stint of the joint work whilst each other performs his. The fable implies that the individual, to possess himself, must sometimes return from his own labors to embrace all the other labors. But unfortunately, this original unit, this fountain of power, has become so distributed to multitudes, has been so minutely subdivided and peddled out, that it is spilled into drops, and cannot be gathered. The state of society is one in which the members have suffered amputations from the trunk, and strut about so many walking monsters a good finger, a neck, a stomach, an elbow, but never a man. Man is thus metamorphosed into a thing, into many things. The planter, who is man sent out into the field to gather food, is seldom cheered by any idea of the true dignity of his ministry. He sees his bushel and his cart, and nothing beyond. He sinks into the farmer instead of man on the farm. The tradesman scarcely ever gives an ideal worth to his work, but is ridden by the routine of his craft, and the soul is subject to dollars. The priest becomes a form, the attorney a statute book, the mechanic a machine, the sailor a rope of a ship. In this distribution of functions, the scholar is the delegated intellect, and the right state he is man-thinking. In the degenerate state, when the victim of society, he tends to become a mere thinker, or still worse, a parrot of other man's thinking. In this view of him, as man-thinking, the theory of his office is contained. Him nature solicits with all her placid, all her monetary pictures. Him the past instructs. Him the future invites. Is not, indeed, every man a student, and do not all things exist for the student's behoof? And finally, is not the true scholar the only true master? But the old oracle said, all things have two handles. Beware the wrong one. In life, too often, the scholar errs with mankind and forfeits his privilege. Let us see him in his school, and consider him in reference to the main influences he receives. 1. The first in time, and the first in importance of the influence upon the mind, is that of nature. Every day the sun, and after sunset, night, and her stars. Ever the wind blows, ever the grass grows. Every day men and women conversing, beholding, and beholden. The scholar is he of all men whom this spectacle most engages. He must settle its value in his mind. What is nature to him? 
there is never a beginning there is never an end to the inexplicable continuity of this web of god but always circular power returning into itself therein it resembles his own spirit whose beginning whose ending he can never find so entire so boundless far too as her splendor shines system on system shooting like stars upward downward without centre without circumference in the mass and in the particle nature hastens to render account of herself to the mind classification begins to the young mind everything is individual stands by itself by and by it finds how to join two things and see in them one nature then three then three thousand and so tyrannized over by its own unifying instinct it goes on tying things together diminishing anomalies discovering roots running underground whereby contrary and remote things cohere and flower out from one stem it presently learns that since the dawn of history there has been a constant accumulation and classifying of facts but what is classification but the perceiving that these objects are not chaotic and are not foreign but have a law which is also a law of the human mind the astronomer discovers that geometry a pure abstraction of the human mind is the measure of planetary motion the chemist finds proportions and intelligible method throughout matter and science is nothing but the finding of analogy identity in the most remote parts the ambitious soul sits down before each refractory fact one after another reduces all strange constitutions all new powers to their class and their law and goes on forever to animate the last fibre of organization the outskirts of nature by insight thus to him to this schoolboy under the bending dome of day is suggested that he and it proceed from one root one is leaf and one is flower relation sympathy stirring in every vein and what is that root is not that the soul of his soul a thought too bold a dream too wild yet when the spiritual light shall have revealed the law of more earthly natures when he has learned to worship the soul and to see that the natural philosophy that now is is only the first gropings of his gigantic hand he shall look forward to an ever-expanding knowledge as to a becoming creator he shall see that nature is the opposite of the soul answering to it part for part one is seal the other is print its beauty is the beauty of his own mind its laws are the laws of his own mind nature then becomes to him the measure of his attainments so much of nature as he is ignorant of so much of his own mind does he not yet possess and in fine the ancient precept know thyself and the modern precept study nature become at last one maxim two the next great influence into the spirit of the scholar is the mind of the past in whatever form whether of literature of art of institutions that mind is inscribed books are the best type of the influence of the past and perhaps we shall get get at the truth learn the amount of this influence more conveniently by considering their value alone the theory of books is noble the scholar of the first age received into him the world around brooded thereon gave it a new arrangement in his mind and uttered it again it came into him life it went from him truth it came to him short-lived actions it went from him immortal thoughts it came to him business it went from him poetry it was dead fact now it is quick thought it can stand and it can go it now endures it now flies it now inspires precisely in proportion to the depth of mind from which it is ensued so high does it soar so long does it sing or i might say it depends on how far the process has gone of transmuting life into truth in proportion to the completeness of the distillation so will the purity and perishableness of the product be but none is quite perfect as no air pump can by any means make a perfect vacuum so neither can any artist entirely exclude the conventional the local the perishable from his book or write a book of pure thought that shall be as efficient in all respects to remote posterity as to contemporaries or rather to the second age each age it is found must write its own books or rather each generation for the next succeeding the book of an older period will not fit this yet hence arises a grave mischief the sacredness which attaches to the act of creation the act of thought is transferred to the record the poet channing was felt to be a divine man henceforth the chant is also divine the writer was a just and wise spirit henceforth it is settled the book is perfect so love of the hero corrupts into worship of his statue instantly the book becomes noxious the guide is a tyrant the sluggish and perverted mind of the multitude slow to open to the incursions of reason having once so opened having once received the book stands upon it and makes an outcry if it is disparaged colleges are built on it books are written on it by thinkers not by man thinking by men of talent that is who start wrong who set out from accepted dogmas not from their own sight of principles 
Meek young men grew up in libraries, believing it their duty to accept the views which Cicero, which Locke, which Bacon have given, forgetful that Cicero, Locke, and Bacon were only young men in libraries when they wrote those books. Hence, instead of man thinking, we have the bookworm. Hence, the book-learned class, who value books as such, not as related to nature and the human constitution, but as making a sort of third estate with the world and the soul. Hence the resorters of readings, the emendators, the bibliomaniacs of all degrees. Books are the best of things, well used, abused, among the worst. What is the right use? What is the one end which all means go to effect? They are for nothing but to inspire. I had better never see a book than to be warped by its attraction clean out of my orbit and made a satellite instead of a system. The one thing in the world of value is the active soul. This every man is entitled to. This every man contains within himself, although, in almost all men, obstructed and, as yet, unborn. The soul active sees absolute truth, and utters truth, or creates. In this action, it is genius. Not the privilege of here and there our favorite, but the sound estate of every man. In its essence, it is progressive. The book, the college, the school of art, the institutions of any kind, stock with some past utterance of genius. This is good, say they. Let us hold by this. They pin me down. They look backwards and not forward. But genius looks forward. The eyes of man are set in his forehead, not in his hindhead. Man hopes. Genius creates. Whatever talents may be, if the man create not, the pure efflux of the deity is not his. Cinders and smoke there may be, but not yet flame. There are creative manners. There are creative actions and creative words. Manners, actions, words, that is, indicative of no custom or authority, but springing spontaneous to the mind's own sense of good and fair. On the other hand, instead of being its own seer, let it receive from another mind its truth, though it were in torrents of light, without periods of solitude, inquest, and self-recovery, and a fatal disservice is done. Genius is always sufficiently the enemy of genius by over-influence. Literature of every nation bears with me witness. The English dramatic poets have Shakespeareized now for two hundred years. Undoubtedly there is a right way of reading, so it be sternly subordinated. Man thinking must not be subdued by his instruments. Books are for the scholar's idle times. When he can read God directly, the hour is too precious to be wasted in other man's transcripts of their readings. But when the intervals of darkness come, as come they must, when the sun is hid and the stars withdraw their shining, we repair to the lamps which were kindled by their ray, to guide our steps in the east again, where the dawn is. We hear that we may speak. The Arabian proverb says, A fig tree, looking on a fig tree, becomes fruitful. It is remarkable the character of the pleasure we derive from the best books. They impress us with the conviction that one nature wrote and the same reads. We read the verses of one of the great English poets, of Chaucer, of Marvel, of Dryden, with the most modern joy, with the pleasure, I mean, that is in great part caused by the abstraction of all time from the verses. There is some awe mixed with the joy of our surprise when this poet, who lived in some past world two or three hundred years ago, says that which lies close to my own soul, that which I also had well nigh thought and said. For if the evidence thence afforded to the philosophical doctrine of the identity of all souls, we should suppose some pre-established harmony, some foresight of souls that were to be, and some preparation of stores for their future wants, like the fact observed in insects, who lay up food before death for the young grub they shall never see. I would not be hurried by any love of system, by any exaggeration of instincts, to underrate the book. We all know that, as the human body can be nourished on any food, though it were boiled grass and the broth of shoes, so the human mind can be fed by any knowledge. And great and heroic men have existed, who have almost no other information than by the printed page. I only would say that it needs a strong head to bear that diet. One must be an inventor to read well. As the proverb says, he that would bring home the wealth of the Indies must carry out the wealth of the Indies. There is then creative reading as well as creative writing. When the mind is braced by labor and invention, the page of whatever book we read becomes luminous with manifold illusion. Every sentence is doubly significant, and the sense of our author is as broad as the world. We then see what is always true, that as the seer's hours of vision is short and rare among heavy days and months, so is its record, perchance, the least part of his volume. The discerning will read, in his Plato or Shakespeare, only the least part, only the authentic utterances of the oracle. All the rest he rejects, were it never so many times Plato's or Shakespeare's. Of course, there is a portion of reading quite indispensable to a wise man. History and exact science he must learn by laborious reading. Colleges, in like manner, have their indispensable office, to teach elements. 
but they can only highly serve us when they aim not to drill but to create when they gather from afar every ray of various genius to their hospitable halls and by the concentrated fires set the hearts of their youth on flame thought and knowledge are natures in which apparatus and pretension avail nothing gowns and pecuniary foundations though of towns of gold can never countervail the least sentence or syllable of wit forget this and our american colleges will recede in their public importance whilst they grow richer every year three there goes in the world a notion that the scholar should be a recluse a valetudinarian as unfit for any handwork or public labor as a penknife or an axe the so-called practical men sneer at speculative men as if because they speculate or see they could do nothing i have heard it said that the clergy who are always more universally than any other class of scholars of the day are addressed as women that the rough spontaneous conversation of men they do not hear but only a mincing and diluted speech they are often virtually disfranchised and indeed they are advocates for their celibacy as far as this is true for the studious class it is not just and wise action is with the scholar subordinate but it is essential without it he is not yet man without it thought can never ripen into truth whilst the world hangs before the eye as a cloud of beauty we cannot even see its beauty inaction is cowardice but there can be no scholar without the heroic mind the preamble of thought the transition through which it passes from the unconscious to the conscious is action only so much do i know as i have lived instantly we know whose words are loaded with life and whose not the world the shadow of the soul or other me lies wide around its attractions are the keys which unlock my thoughts and make me acquainted with myself i run eagerly into this resounding tumult i grasp the hands of those around me and take my place in the ring to suffer and to work taught by an instinct that so shall the dumb abyss be vocal with speech i pierce its order i dissipate its fear i dispose of it within the circuit of my expanding life so much only of life as i know by experience so much of the wilderness have i vanquished and planted or so far have I extended my being, my dominion. I do not see how any man can afford, for the sake of his nerves and his nap, to spare any action in which he can partake. It is pearls and rubies to his discourse. Drudgery, calamity, exasperation, want are instructors in eloquence and wisdom. The true scholar grudges every opportunity of action passed by as a loss of power. It is the raw materials out of which the intellect molds her splendid products. A strange process, too, this by which experience is converted into thought, as a mulberry leaf is converted into satin. The manufacturer goes forward at all hours. The action events of our childhood and youth are now matters of calmest observation. They lie like fair pictures in the air, not so with our recent actions, with the business which we now have at hand. On this we are quite unable to speculate. Our affections are yet circulate through it. We no more feel or know it than we feel the feet or the hand or the brain of our body. The new deed is yet a part of life, remains for a time immersed in our unconscious life. In some contemplative hour it detaches itself from the life like a ripe fruit, to become a thought of the mind. Instantly it is raised, transfigured. The corruptible has put on incorruption. Henceforth it is an object of beauty, however base its origin and neighborhood. Observe, too, the impossibility of antedating this act. In its grub state it cannot fly, it cannot shine, it is a dull grub. But suddenly, without observation, the self-same thing unfurls beautiful wings and is an angel of wisdom. So there is no fact, no event in our private history, which shall not, sooner or later, lose its adhesive inert form and astonish us by soaring from our body into the Empyrean. Cradle and infancy, school and playground, the fear of boys and dogs and furals, the love of little maids and berries, and many another fact that once filled the whole sky are gone already. Friend and relative, profession and party, town and country, and nation and world must also soar and sing. Of course, he who has put forth his total strength in fit action has the richest return of wisdom. I will not shut myself out of this globe of action, and transplant an oak into a flower-pot, there to hunger and pine, nor trust the revenue of some single faculty, and exhaust one vein of thought, much like the Savoyards, who, getting their livelihood by carving shepherds, shepherdesses, and smoking Dutchmen for all Europe, went out one day to the mountain to find stock, and discovered that they had willed up the last of their pine-trees authors we have in numbers who have written out their vein and who moved by commendable prudence sail for greece or palestine follow the trapper into the prairie or ramble around algiers to replenish their merchantable stock if it were only for a vocabulary the scholar would be covetous of action life is our dictionary years are well spent in country labors in town in the insight into trades and manufactures in frank intercourse with many men and women 
in science in art to the one end of mastering and all their facts of language by which to illustrate and embody our perceptions i learn immediately from any speaker how much he has already lived through the poverty or the splendor of his speech life lies behind us as the quarry from whence we get tiles and copestones for the masonry of today. this is the way to learn grammar colleges and books only copy the language with the field and the workyard made but the final value of action, like that of books, and better than books, is that it is a resource. The great principle of undulation in nature, that shows itself in the inspiring and expiring of the breath, in desire and satiety, in the ebb and flow of the sea, in day and night, in heat and cold, and as yet more deeply ingrained in every atom and every fluid, is known to us under the name of polarity. These fits of easy transmission and reflection, as Newton called them, are the laws of nature, because they are the laws of the spirit. The mind now thinks, now acts, and each fact reproduces the other. When the artist has exhausted his materials, when his fancy no longer paints, when thoughts are no longer apprehended, and books are a weariness, he has always the resource to live. Character is higher than intellect. Thinking is the function, life the functionary. The stream retreats to its source. A great soul will be strong to live, as well as strong to think. Does he lack organ or medium to impart his truths? He can still fall back on this elemental force of living them. This is a total act. Thinking is a partial act. Let the grandeur of justice shine on his affairs. Let the beauty of affection cheer his lowly roof. Those far from fame, who dwell and act with him, will feel the force of his constitution in the doings and passages of the days better than it can be measured by any public or designed display. Time shall teach him that the scholar loses no hour which the man lives. Herein he unfolds the sacred germ of his instinct, screened from influence. What is lost in seemliness is gained in strength. Not out of those on whom systems of education have exhausted their culture come the helpful giant, to destroy the old to build the new, but out of the unhandled savage nature, out of the terrible druids and berserkers, come at last Alfred and Shakespeare. I hear, therefore, with joy, whatever is beginning to be said of the dignity and necessity of labor to every citizen. There is virtue yet in the hoe and the spade, for learned as well as for unlearned hands. Labor is everywhere welcome, always we are invited to work. Only by this limitation observe, that a man shall not for the sake of wider activity sacrifice any opinion at the popular judgment and modes of action. I have now spoken of the education of the scholar by nature, by books, and by action. It remains to say somewhat of his duties. They are such as become man-thinking. They may all be comprised in self-trust. The office of the scholar is to cheer, to raise, and to guide men by showing them facts amidst appearances. He plies the slow, unhonored, and unpaid task of observation. Flamsteed and Herschel, in their glazed observatories, may catalogue the stars with the praise of all men, yet the results, being splendid and useful, honor is sure. But he, in his private observatory, cataloguing obscure nebulous stars of the human mind, which as yet no man has thought of as such, watching days and months, sometimes for a few facts, correcting still his old records, must relinquish display and immediate fame. In the long period of his preparation, he must betray often an ignorance and shiftlessness in popular arts, incurring the disdain of the able who shoulder him aside. Long he must stammer in his speech, often forego the living for the dead. Worse yet, he must accept, how often, poverty and solitude. For the ease and pleasure of treading the old road, accepting the fashions and education, the religion of society, to make the cross of making his own, and, of course, the self-accusation, the faint heart, the frequent uncertainty and loss of time, which are the nettles and tangling vines in the way of the self-relying and self-directed, and the state of virtual hostility in which he seems to stand to society, and especially to educate his society. For all this loss and scorn, what offset? He is to find consolation and exercise in the highest function of human nature. He is one who raises himself from private considerations and breathes and lives on public and illustrious thoughts. He is the world's eye. He is the world's heart. He is to resist the vulgar prosperity that retrogrades even to barbarism by preserving and communicating heroic sentiments, noble biographies, melodious verse, and the conclusions of history. Whatsoever oracles the human heart in all emergencies and all solemn hours has uttered as its commentary on the world of actions, these he shall receive and impart. And whatever new verdict reason from her inviolable seat pronounces on the passing men and events of today, this he shall hear and promulgate. These being his functions, it becomes him to feel all confidence in himself, and defer never to the popular cry. He and he only knows the world. The world of any moment is the merest appearance. 
some great decorum some fetish of a government some ephemeral trade or war or man is cried up by half mankind and cried down by their half as if all depended on this particular up and down the odds are that the whole question is not worth the poorest thought which the scholar has lost in listening to the controversy let him not quit his belief that a pop-gun is a pop-gun though the ancient honourable of the earth affirm it to be the crack of doom in silence in steadiness in severe abstraction let him hold by himself add observation observation patient of neglect patient of reproach and bide his own time happy enough if he can satisfy himself alone that this day he has seen something truly success treads on every right step for the instinct is sure that prompts him to tell his brother what he thinks he then learns that going down into the secrets of his own mind he has descended into the secrets of all minds he learns that he who has mastered any law in his private thoughts is master to that extent of all men whose language he speaks and of all whose language his own can be translated the poet in utter solitude remembering his spontaneous thoughts and recording them is found to have recorded that which men in crowded cities find true for them also the orator distrusts at first the fitness of his frank confessions his want of knowledge of the persons he addresses, until he finds that he is the complement of his hearers that they drink his words because he fulfills for them their own nature the deeper he dives in his privatest secretest presentiment to his wonder he finds this is the most acceptable most public and universally true the people delight in it the better part of every man feels this is my music this is myself in self-trust all the virtues are comprehended free should the scholar be free and brave free even to the definition of freedom without any hindrance that does not arise out of his own constitution brave for fear is a thing which a scholar by his very function puts behind him fear always springs from ignorance it is a shame to find if his tranquillity amidst dangerous times arises from the presumption that like children and women his is a protected class or if he seek a temporary peace by the diversion of his thoughts from politics or vexed questions hiding his head like an ostrich in the flowering bushes peeping into microscopes or turning rhymes as a boy whistles to keep up his courage so is the danger a danger still so is the fear worse manlike let him turn and face it let him look into its eye and search its nature inspect its origin see the whelping of this lion which lies no great way back he will then find in himself a perfect comprehension of its nature and extent he will have made his hands meet on the other side and can henceforth defy it and pass on superior the world is his who can see through its pretension what deafness what stone-blown custom what overgrown air you behold is there only by sufferance by your sufferance see it to be a lie and you have already dealt it its mortal blow yes we are the cowed we are the trustless it is a mischievous notion that we are come late in nature that the world was finished a long time ago as the world was plastic and fluid in the hands of god so it is ever to so much of his attributes as we bring to it to ignorance and sin it is flint they adapt themselves to it as they may but in proportion as a man has anything in him divine the firmament flows before him and takes his signet and form not he is great who can alter matter but he who can alter my state of mind they are the kings of the world who give the color of their present thought to all nature and all art and persuade men by the cheerful serenity of their carrying the matter that this thing which they do is the apple which the ages have desired to pluck now at last ripe and inviting nation to the harvest the great man makes the great thing wherever macdonald sits there is the head of the table linnaeus makes botany the most alluring of studies and it wins it from the farmer and the herb woman davy chemistry and cuvier fossils the day is always his who works on it with serenity and great aims the unstable estimates of men crowd to him whose mind is filled with the truth as a heaped wave of the atlantic follows the moon for this self-trust the reason is deeper than can be fathomed darker than can be lightened i might not carry with me the feeling of my audience in stating my own belief but i have already shown the ground of my hope in averting it to the doctrine that man is one i believe man has been wronged he has wronged himself he has almost lost the light that can lead him back to his prerogatives men are become of no account men in history men in the world of today are bugs are spawn and are called the mass the herd in a century in a millennium one or two men that is to say one or two approximations to the right state of every man all the rest behold in the hero of the poet their own green and crude being ripened yes and our consent to be less so that may attain to its full nature what a testimony full of grandeur full of pity is borne to the demands of his nature by the poor clansman the poor partisan who rejoices in the glory of his chief 
the poor and low find some amends to their immense moral capacity for their acquiescence in a political and social inferiority they are content to be brushed like flies from the path of a great person so that justice shall be done by him to that common nature which it is the dearest desire of all to see enlarged and glorified they send themselves in the great man's light and feel it to be their own element they cast the dignity of man from their downtrodden selves upon the shoulders of a hero, and will perish to add one drop of blood to make that great heart beat, those giant sinews combat and conquer. He lives for us, and we live in him. Men such as they are very naturally seek money or power, and power because it is good as money, the spoil so called of office. And why not? For they desire to be the highest, and this, in their sleepwalking, they dream is highest. Wake them, and they shall quit the false good, and leap to the true, and leave governments to clerks and desks. This revolution is to be wrought by the gradual domestication of the idea of culture. The main enterprise of the world for splendor, for extent, is the upbuilding of a man. Here are the materials strewn along the ground. The private life of one man shall be a more illustrious monarchy, more formidable to its enemy, more sweet and serene in its influence to its friend, than any kingdom in history. For a man rightly viewed comprehendeth the particular natures of all men. Each philosopher, each bard, each actor has only done for me, as by a delegate, or well, one day I can do for myself. The books which once we valued more than the apple of the eye we have quite exhausted. What is that but saying that we have come up with the point of view which the universal mind took through the eyes of one scribe? We have been that man, and have passed on. First one, then another, we drain all cisterns and waxing greater by all these supplies we crave a better and more abundant food the man has never lived that can feed us ever the human mind cannot be enshrined in a person who shall set a barrier on any one side to his unbounded unbondable empire it is one central fire which flaming out of the lips of etna lightens the capes of sicily and now out the throats of vesuvius illuminates the towers and vineyards of naples it is one light which beams out of a thousand stars it is one soul which animates all men but I have dealt perhaps tediously upon this abstraction of the scholar. I ought not to delay any longer to add what I have to say, of nearer reference to the time and to this country. Historically, there is thought to be a difference in the ideas which predominate over successive epochs, and there are data for marking the genius of the classic, the romantic, and now the reflective or philosophic age. With the views I have intimated of the oneness or the identity of the mind through all individuals, I do not yet dwell on these differences. In fact, I believe each individual passes through all three. The boy is a Greek, the youth romantic, the adult reflective. I deny not, however, that a revolution in the leading idea may be distinctly enough traced. Our age is bewailed as the age of introversion. Must that needs be evil? We, it seems, are critical. We are embarrassed with second thoughts. We cannot enjoy anything for hankering to know whereof the pleasure consists. We are lined with eyes. We see with our feet. The time is infected with hamlets and happiness, sicklied over with the pale cast of thought. Is it so bad, then? Sight is the last thing to be pitied. Would we be blind? Do we fear lest we should outsee nature and God and drink truth dry? I look upon the discontent of the literary class as a mere announcement of the fact that they find themselves not in the state of mind of their fathers, and regret the coming state as untried, as a boy dreads the water before he has learned that he can swim. If there is any period one should desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution, when the old and new stand side by side and admit of being compared? when the energies of all men are searched by fear and by hope, when the historic glories of the old can be compensated by the rich possibilities of the new era? This time, like all times, is a very good one, if we but know what to do with it. I read with joy some of the auspicious signs of the coming days as the glimmer already through poetry and art, through philosophy and science, through church and state. One of these signs is the fact that the same movement which affected the elevation of what was called the lowest class in the state assumed in literature a very marked and has benign an aspect. Instead of the sublime and the beautiful, the near, the low, the common was explored and poeticized. That which has been negligently trodden underfoot by those who are harnessing and provisioning themselves for long journeys into far countries is suddenly found to be richer than all foreign parts. The literature of the poor, the feelings of the child, the philosophy of the street, the meaning of the house life are the topics of the same. It is a great stride. It is a sign, is it not, of new vigor when the extremities are made active, when currents of warm life run into the hands and the feet. I ask not for the great, the remote, the romantic. What is doing in Italy or Arabia? What is Greek art, provincial minstrelsy? 
I embrace the common. I explore and sit at the feet of the familiar, the low. Give me insight into today, and you may have the antique and future worlds. What would we really know the meaning of? The meal and the firkin, the milk and the pan, the ballad in the street, the news of the boat, the glance of the eye, the form and the gait of the body. Show me the ultimate reasons for these matters. Show me the sublime presence of the highest spiritual cause lurking, as always it does, in these suburbs and extremities of nature. Let me see every trifle bristling with polarity that ranges it instantly on an eternal law. And the shop, the plough, and the ledger refer to the light cause by which light undulates and poets sing, and the world lies no longer a dull miscellany and lumber room, but has form and order. There is no trifle, there is no puzzle, but one design unites and animates the farthest pinnacle in the lowest trench. This idea has inspired the genius of Goldsmith, Burns, Coper, and in a newer time of Goethe, Wordsworth, and Carlyle. This idea they have differently followed and with various success. In contrast with their writings, the style of Pope, of Johnson, of Gibbon, look cold and pedantic. This writing is blood-warm. Man is surprised to find that things near are not less beautiful and wondrous than things remote. The near explains the far. The drop is a small ocean. A man is related to all nature. This perception of the worth of the vulgar is fruitful in discoveries. Goethe, in this very thing, the most modern of the moderns, has shown us, as none ever did, the genius of the ancients. There is one man of genius who has done much for this philosophy of life, whose literary value has never yet been rightly estimated. I mean Emanuel Swedenborg. The most imaginative of men, yet writing with the precision of a mathematician, he endeavors to engraft a pure philosophical ethics on the popular Christianity of his time. Such an attempt, of course, must have difficulty, which no genius could surmount, but he saw and showed the connection between nature and the affections of the soul. He pierced the emblematic or spiritual character of the visible, audible, tangible world. Especially did his shade-loving muse hover and interpret the lower parts of nature. He showed the mysterious bond that allies moral evil to the foul material forms, and has given in epical parables a theory of insanity, of beasts, of unclean and fearful things. Another sign of the times, also marked by an analogous political movement, is the new importance given to the single person. Everything that tends to insulate the individual, to surround him with barriers of natural respect, so that each man shall feel the world is his, the man shall treat with man as a sovereign state with a sovereign state, tends to true union as well as greatness. I learned, said the melancholy Pastelosi, that no man in God's wide earth is either willing or able to help any other man. Help must come from the bosom alone. The scholar is that man who must take up into himself all the ability of the time, all the contributions of the past, all the hopes of the future. He must be a university of knowledges. If there be one lesson more than another which shall pierce his ear, it is, The world is nothing, the man is all. In yourself is the law of all nature, and you know not yet how a globule of sap ascends. In yourself slumbers the whole of reason. It is for you to know all, it is for you to dare all. Mr. President and gentlemen, this confidence in the unsearched might of man belongs, by all motives, by all prophecy, by all preparation, to the American scholar. We have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. The spirit of the American freeman is already suspected to be timid, imitative, tame. Public and private avarice make the air we breathe thick and fat. The scholar is decent, indolent, complacent. See already the tragic consequence. The mind of this country, taught to aim at low objects, eats upon itself. There is no work for any but the decorous and the complacent. Young men of the fairest promise, who begin life upon our shores, inflated by the mountain winds, shined upon by the stars of God, find the earth below not in unison with these, but are hindered from action by the disgust which the principles on which business is managed inspire, and turn drudges or die of disgust, some of them suicides. What is the remedy? They do not yet see, and thousands of young men as hopeful now crowding to the barriers of the career do not yet see, that if the single man plant himself indomitably on his instincts, and there abide, the huge world will come round to him. Patience, patience. With the shades of all the good and great for company, and for solace the perspective of your own infinite life, and for work the study of the communication of principles, and making those instincts prevalent, the conversion of the world. Is it not a cheap disgrace in the world not to be a unit, not to be reckoned one character, not to yield that peculiar fruit which each man was created to bear, but to be reckoned in the gross, in the hundred, or the thousand, of the party, the section to which we belong, and our opinion predicted geographically as the north or the south? Not so, brothers and friends. Please God, ours shall not be so. 
We will walk on our own feet. We will work with our own hands. We will speak our own minds. The study of letters shall be no longer a name for pity, for doubt, and for sensual indulgence. The dread of man and love of man shall be a wall of defense and a wreath of joy around all. A nation of men will for the first time exist, because each believes himself inspired by the divine soul, which also inspires all men. End of The American Scholar Recording by Daniel Christopher June You may visit my website at perfectidius.com That's perfectidius.com